Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. It's lovely to see all of your faces. I have some uh, quick announcements before our worship service begins. The first is that it is Mothering Sunday. And traditionally in this parish, uh, the um, woman of the parish would receive uh, flowers at the end of this service. That is still true, but those of you that are attending Vestry, uh, we will be passing out um, flowers in the parish hall instead. If you can't stay for the Vestry meeting, uh, there will be daffodils at the back of the church for you to take uh, on the way home. Um, uh, other things in the announcements. Uh, there is a Monday Thursday sign-up list. Uh, I believe it's um, just outside the, uh, the doors here. Um, we are cooking meals for, uh, I, I guess, a soup for Monday Thursday, and we need volunteers to help make the soup. And uh, um, I think I might help out making soup as well. I'm um, a bit of a foodie, so I'd love to help out. So if anybody wants to join me in that, uh, please sign up at the back. Uh, uh, coffee hour is returning to the parish on Palm Sunday. So Palm Sunday will be our first coffee hour. Again, we're looking for volunteers to help with uh, coffee hour. And uh, for those of you joining us by Zoom today, there is a special link for the Extraordinary Vestry uh, Zoom um, account. So make sure uh, it's not the one that you sign on for worship. It's, it's a different link and you can find it on the parish website or in the leaflet today. Uh, it's a special link, so make sure you go there instead of uh, signing on to the normal one. Uh, we also have an Agape uh, service coming up on Sunday, April 3rd. That's next Sunday. And uh, I think that's it. Are there any other announcements that I'm not thinking of? Hearing none, we will spend a moment in silence before worship begins. Oh, thank you. Um, David points out that the hymns today are in the Canadian hymn book. The, it's also a blue book, but it doesn't have the, uh, the flag on it. Yeah, it's the Canadian flag one that you want. So, thank you, David. Are we short on hymns? Does anybody have spare Canadian hymn books? <laughs> Perfect. Jules has found some. I'm going to I'm going to retrieve two more from downstairs.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The community of St. Martin's acknowledges that we live and work and worship on the ancestral and unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. May the reconciling love of Christ be reflected in our words and in our actions. Almighty God, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm standing up here because the batteries on my mic have just, um, have just died. Uh, so I'm gonna do the children's talk from up here, if that's okay. Can people see me from here? Okay. All right. Can everyone tell me what I have here? It's a box. And on it, it says, lost and found. So um, are there any children here? Just grown up children, right? Are there any children on the, uh, on Zoom? Maybe one, okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask the grown-up children some questions then. Uh, have you ever lost anything that was precious to you? Okay, tell me, tell me what, the, what it was. Car keys. Car keys. <laughs> what did the car keys mean to you? What did the car keys mean to you? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of your freedom, right? Yeah. What else have people lost? Yeah. A watch. Picking strawberries. And was the watch important to you? It was. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. <laughs> Any others? 
phone. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could be the worst thing to lose. Yeah, what does the phone mean to you? The only link you have to your daughter. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else lose anything? People. People, yeah, people. Oh yeah, that's a big one. That's hard. An address book, yeah, yeah. I've got some things here in a lost and found box. Um, so I, like you said, I there's keys and then there's a, a wallet, somebody's wallet with their credit card and oh what's this a little hedgehog stuffy what do you what do you think the hedgehog stuffy means to somebody it's their comfort right yeah and then uh this can anybody see that a ring yeah can you imagine losing your this actually happened to me lost my wedding ring which is a tough one because it's the very first gift that your new spouse, your husband or wife, the very first gift they ever gave you and you lose it. Oh boy, do you do feel that? Yeah. And then I once lost this. This is my favorite thing in the world other than the people in my life. I love this thing. This is my knife. That's, that's a handmade Japanese knife. It's got little uh, dents in the side of it. It's called sashimi, which, because it looks like fish scales. Sashimi means the, it looks like fish. And, uh, and I used to be a cook. And when I first started dating, this is how I would impress people. I would, I would make dishes with it. And it's a big part of my creative life. I love making food. If I lost this, I would really feel it. But I was telling you that I once lost something else and that was my daughter. And that's my daughter there. I know this isn't a very big picture. I'm sorry, everybody. But that's my daughter there. Her name is Naomi. And we lost her actually probably right around the time this picture was taken. She was five or six at the time. And we'd moved into a new home in, a, in an apartment building. And uh, uh, my wife and I were making breakfast and dealing with the baby and suddenly realized we hadn't seen our daughter for maybe 30 minutes. And normally you hear the kids when they're in the house. And so we didn't, we didn't know where she'd gone. And we looked through the whole house, through the whole apartment, nowhere to be found. And when a five-year-old or a six-year-old disappears from your house, boy, do crazy things enter your head. And we ran around the neighborhood, everywhere around the neighborhood, because we knew she could have opened the door and left the apartment building. And we searched everywhere. We, we ran around the neighborhood, we went to the local parks and finally we, we were in such desperation that we found the caretaker of our building and there's video cameras in our building. So we went through the video to see what happened. And our daughter had left our building and went into another building and waited for somebody to open the door and went into that building. And she'd been in that building before. And she went up the elevator into their library and then got stuck inside their library. So she was all alone for 30 minutes inside a library. You can imagine what a five-year-old experienced for those, those 30 minutes. So, um, so I can't tell you how amazing it was when we found her. And so uh, today's gospel is kind of like one of those stories. It's a story about, um, you know, Jesus told this story about a, a man who lost something that was really precious to him. Uh, this man had two sons, and the younger son asked his father to give him his, uh, the money that he would inherit someday when his father died, and the father chose to give it to him, and the boy left to go out to see the world and to do whatever he wanted to do, and the father, I think, was brokenhearted, and he had lost one of his sons, just like I'd lost one my daughter. And it wasn't long before the boy wasted all his money in kind of crazy ways. And uh, he didn't have any money left, so he needed to take a job to make some money. And he got the job of feeding pigs, which was a very smelly and gross job. And the boy was so hungry that he even ate the rotten food that the pigs were eating. And he looked at this mess that he'd gotten himself into 
And he said, you know what? My father's servants live better than I do. I'll return home and I'll tell him, because I have been, I'll tell him that I did him wrong. And as the boy is approaching the father's house, house, his loving father who'd been watching and hoping for his son's return, saw him coming and ran to meet him. And he threw his arms around the boy and hugged him and kissed him. The father was so happy his son had returned that he gave him a robe and put a ring on his fingers. And he orders, ordered his servants to make a feast, which is kind of crazy. It's kind of like when I found my daughter, it's like I suddenly organized a giant birthday party for her with a bouncy castle. And I spent all my money on the sweetest, most chocolatey cake in the world. And I decorated the house and I brought in a live band and a magician and we celebrated that Naomi was found. It's kind of a crazy story, right? It's weird that I would do that. I felt like it when I found her though. And that's, that's what God feels like when he finds us. Jesus told this story to show that the kind of, God, uh, kind of love that God has is that kind of love for us, for his or her children. When one of God's children strays away, God always welcomes him or her back with open arms when they return home. Aren't you glad you have a heavenly father or a heavenly mother just like that who loves you? even when maybe you didn't deserve it or you got yourself in trouble. I know I am. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your unconditional love and unending forgiveness. We are thankful that even when we stray away, you welcome us home with open arms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came from heaven to be the true bread, which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please sit to listen for the word of God. The first reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased. On that day, they ate the produce of the land and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord.
A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. You see, everything has become of reconciliation to us so we are ambassadors for christ since god is making his appeal through us we entreat you on behalf of christ be reconciled to god for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of god the word of the lord thanks be to god The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he decided his property, he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. 
So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the sudden said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. There is a professor of homiletics, of preaching, at the Vancouver School of Theology, a man named Jason Biasi, who told me recently that if you're reading the Bible and you don't feel convicted, you're not reading it right. If you aren't reading the Bible against yourself and against your own self-interests and the interests of your own community, then you aren't reading it right. But if you read the Bible in a way that makes you repent, which is to say, if you read the Bible in a way that transforms you and the way you think and the way you love and the way you act, then you are probably reading it right. And to this, I would only add the following. If you read the Bible and the good news seems straightforward and easy, then you are probably not reading it right. But if you read the, the Bible and the good news and it seems almost nonsensical and wild, if the good news bucks any standard of worldly common sense, then you are probably reading it right. And finally, if the Bible causes you, sorry, if the Bible causes in you feelings of astonishment and joy, then you are probably reading it right. The parable of the prodigal son begins with that son asking his father for his inheritance. The great theologian N.T. Wright explains that in Jesus' culture, 
for the son to ask for his share of the inheritance before his father's death was the equivalent of saying to him, I wish you were dead. This was a disrespectful and dishonoring and insulting act, one that would have earned this younger son disrespect and dishonor and insult. After all, children owe everything to their parents, not the other way around. But contrary to all expectations, this loving father agrees to divide the property between his two sons. And as if to underline the point of the younger son's disrespect, Jesus tells us that the younger son then abandons his father, abandons all responsibility, and cuts all familial ties with his father and his brother and his family. And he cuts ties with his community and his culture and God's chosen people, Israel, and travels to a foreign country. And there he wastes his inheritance having sex with prostitutes and living wild. For the community around Jesus that every day traded in the currencies of respect and honor and shame and religiosity, this story must have been truly shocking. It would be shocking in our day too. Imagine giving one of your children, your son, all that you have saved and earned for him. And then to find out he has used it to take advantage of desperate and vulnerable women on the downtown east side, using them as sex objects. Can you imagine what you'd feel and what you'd do? What kind of a person would take their inheritance, a gift from a parent to a child that expresses love in very material ways, what kind of a person would take their inheritance and use it in such unbelievable ways? You are, you are that kind of person. I am, I am that kind of person. All of us, we are all that kind of person without exception. Our inheritance was the earth. Our inheritance was creation, a beautiful gift from the creator, a gift that expresses the creator's love for us in a material way. It couldn't be more precious and more wonderful. Who hasn't marveled at the wonder of creation, at the smell of the briny sea, the rustling of long grass and warm breezes, the crabs that hide under rocks and the birds that dance erotic dances with each other and, civ and sing love songs to one another and the apes who communicate intelligently with us and with a simple look in their eyes or a gesture of their hands. Who hasn't marveled at a waterfall in a forest or a penguin on sea ice or a seal slipping through a waving kelp forest? It's simply breathtaking, this gift of creation. A gift handed down to us from our human ancestors, generation upon generation, passed on through our ancestor species, evolving from previous species, inherited from the earliest life forms, back through the cosmic forces that created suns and their planets, back through the weft and warp of time and space to the very beginning of creation to God, a gift given to us by the maker and sustainer of the universe. And we took that inheritance and desecrated it. We have consumed this wonderful gift with an insatiable hunger, with our vacations and our renovations and our teardowns and our trinkets and our gadgets and our Christmas gifts and our plastic Easter baskets and our internal combustion engines, we have single-handedly caused one of the greatest extinction events in all of geological history. And at no point in human history 
has the average human being caused more damage to the planet than you and I have over our lifetimes. And we keep at it, using the earth as though it were a prostitute, treating creation as an object of our own gratification with no thought to the harm that we are doing. The word prodigal means extravagantly wasteful, which we have been. This parable about the prodigal son is about us, prodigal sons and daughters and children. If you don't feel convicted, you aren't reading it right. And the parable story continues exactly where our story is about to go. The son finds himself with nothing to eat, alone in a famine of his own making. We face a coming famine. The dread of what's to come in our ecological crisis is terrifying. But what makes it so much worse, unbearably worse, is knowing that it's all our fault. We did this, you and me. We all could have stopped it. We still can, but we haven't and we won't. That is the terrifying truth. It is the scarlet letter we cannot hide and the burden too heavy to carry. That is our terrible legacy and our terrible guilt which compounds on top of our terrible fear of the famine, that we and our children somehow deserve what is to come. We are as low as a starving Jewish man fighting swine for filthy food in a pig pen. So far, the Pharisees and the people around Jesus have heard the parable of the prodigal son to this point and hear a story about the consequences of sin. And the only way the story can turn right, they think, and we think, is if the son repents, if we repent, which is to say, only if the son feels the full shame of his actions and decides to correct them, only then will order be restored. And sure enough, Jesus tells us that the younger son has come to himself, which means he has come to his senses. He suddenly realizes who he is and what he's done and what he's lost. And in guilt, he decides to return to his father, confessing his sin, knowing he will no longer be loved and adopting a sorrowful and pitiful stature in life that reflects his previous wasteful ways. And so it must be, we think, that we must also repent. We also have to admit that we have been terrible stewards of a precious and fragile gift. The Pharisees and all those with common sense know that this is the only way to save ourselves and the world. All would be right again if we just changed our ways. Once we humbly confess our sins and wickedness, then we will be saved. And thus ends the parable of the prodigal son. But my dear friends, Jesus wasn't telling the parable of the prodigal son. He was telling the parable of the prodigal father. If it was the parable of the prodigal son Jesus was telling, then the son would return to the father and say, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I deserve nothing more than to be your lowly servant. And then God would look on him with kindness and welcome him back, glad that his son corrected his ways and that the son had learned his lesson. But this is not the parable we are reading. Jesus tells us that while the son was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Senior figures in your community do not run like school children. 
They do not fling themselves on people that have hurt them and kiss them as if nothing has happened. This is ridiculous behavior. Really, Jesus meant the father's actions to sound ridiculous. And he gets even more ridiculous. The loving father orders his servants to clothe his son with the best robe. That's the robe that the master should wear. And to put a ring on his son's finger. And we're talking here about the master's signet ring, something you would use to stamp your debts with, like you would in a wax. It's a ring that you could buy things with. The father is giving the son a no limits credit card that could buy him anything. Given the son's previous predilections, this is shocking. And then the father puts sandals on his son's feet, which is what a slave does for a master. This is ridiculous behavior. This son's crimes are huge. The dishonor is total as any imaginable in the ancient world. And yet he is clothed by his father with all the symbols of honor and respect. And the father doesn't even wait for the son's apology. He doesn't even acknowledge the apology when it is made. Not once does the father refer to his son's repentance in the rest of the parable. Not once does he say that the son has repented and therefore he is family again. Instead, he does something still more totally ridiculous. The father orders his servants to prepare a fatted calf to celebrate his son, an enormous expense in the ancient world. And then he throws an extravagant party the ridiculousness of this father knows no limits. Seriously, what else could Jesus come up with to make this any more ridiculous? And why has this father showered his son with love and honor and respect? He says only this. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. To be prodigal means to be extravagantly wasteful. This is the story of a prodigal father whose prodigal love is extravagantly wasteful. The wasteful love that the elder son objects to. If we are the prodigal sons and daughters who have defiled creation, who have taken our inheritance and desecrated it, then what does the parable of the prodigal father have to tell us? It tells us that God is not interested in tallying our sins, not even the tiniest little bit. The story where we are dragged into court and made to account for all we have done, where we get what we deserve, that's a different story. It's not the one that Jesus is telling. That's the parable of the prodigal son that we all thought we were hearing today. The parable of the prodigal father tells us that we are loved to no end, no matter what, even after what we've done to the planet. If you're like me, you were probably chafing at this a little bit. We can't get away with our pollution it's not okay. We can't get away with our sin and our destruction without consequence. Even now, as I am preaching this, I'm thinking, surely I've gotten this story wrong. It's the repentance that really counts. It's the repentance and the guilt and the self-flagellation of the son that results in him being celebrated. It'll be our promise to do better, to drive less, to consume less, that will make things right and will save us. But it's not. I've read this parable over and over, and that's not the story of the prodigal father. 
What does it mean that God is so wasteful with his love that he or she would celebrate us and honor us and love us, even though we've been so disrespectful? What does that mean to you? If this parable isn't about your guilt and shame and your need to repent, then what is it about? Isn't it about how important you are? How cherished you are? How sacred you are? How sacred all of creation is? Isn't that what the gospel is about? That you are so loved that God would run through a field and throw God's arms around you and would kiss you? That God would lower God's self for you, for the person that you actually are, not the person you hoped you would be, that God's love is prodigal, extravagant, wasteful, abundant beyond all reason. What if that was the good news? Then what? Let us confess the faith of your baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, of our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand, sit, or kneel as is your custom for prayer. To the bidding, loving God, we respond, we put our trust in you. On this Mothering Sunday, we give thanks for Jerusalem, Mother of the Church. We are thankful for all cathedrals and mother churches everywhere. We thank you, God, for your servants, Archbishops Justin, Linda, Mark, and Lynn, Bishop John, and Reverend Mark. May they lead your flock with integrity and truth, instituting processes that promote equality and inclusion. In today's Anglican communion, we pray for the Church of the Province of Myanmar, our companion parish of St. Leo the Great Sad Sadan and San Luis Mabaay in the Diocese of the Northern Philippines, and in Canada, our theological colleges. In our diocese, we pray for St. George Maple Ridge, the Reverends David Edgerton and Melody Pearson, St. George Fort Langley with the Venerable Kelly Duncan and Reverends Eileen Nurse and Karen Saunders, as well as the Street Outreach Initiative under the Reverend Matthew Johnson. Thank you that in our diocese, we have begun to examine the processes we use to become more inclusive. Loving God, we put our trust in you. Today's scripture describes how you provide for your people to counter scarcity. Thank you for your abundant blessings over the years 
to the community of St. Martin's to proclaim your word and richly worship you, even during a pandemic. You instruct us that everything old has passed away and that in Christ is a new creation. May we find courage to begin a new chapter, examining and developing what we do so that all may be honored in how we live, including youth and young people, just as you invite all into your family. Today, we pray for Doreen, Ken and Colleen and Eileen. Bless them, and may we all share about your love with others in our daily lives. Loving God, we put our trust in you. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and guide our discussions today, whether we at St. Martin's decide to go elsewhere or whether we continue with renewed determination and camaraderie being open to change. We ask you for wisdom and guidance along the way. Help us to stay true to our souls and lean on you only as people of unwavering faith, following your will one sure step at a time to bear fruit for your kingdom. Loving God, we put our trust in you. We ask you to guide the leaders of the nations to safeguard people everywhere through sharing of resources to foster safety, equality, and peace. Be with Elizabeth, our queen, Justin, our prime minister, John, our premier, and our local mayors. Give them wisdom as they govern. Help those in Russia and everywhere who are trying to do your will within their systems of governance. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, Eastern Europe, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Mexico, and other regions of the world affected by war and strife. We pray for people fleeing to safety and for civilian captives of war. May you protect and strengthen them. Loving God, we put our trust in you. We thank you for all our mothers on this day, those who brought us into this life and those who have mothered us along the way. We also pray for people impacted by illness, caregiving, sorrow, or isolation. Grant them strength not to give in to dis disillusionment or despair. May those who need to feel your closeness find peace in you as we name those we know aloud or in our hearts at this time. Loving God, we put our trust in you. Help us to change our selfish and wasteful ways to protect your beautiful gifts of creation and how we live. Help us to understand your word and be transformed in spirit. Loving God, we put our trust in you. Together, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your enduring compassion and generosity for celebrating with us when we choose to return to you to live in equality and harmony, no matter what our past actions may have been. Grant us wisdom in all that we do. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways 
to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please stand as you're able. of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
we give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which was given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the, give, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from, our, from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your son in his sacrifice that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. In the language closest to our heart, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glories are yours. Now and forever. Amen. We break this bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God, we are light in the midst of us. Bring us to the light of the world. The gifts of God for us, the holy people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Gracious God, giver of life, you enlighten all who come into your world. Fill our hearts with the splendor of your grace, that we may perfectly love you and worthily praise your holy name, in Jesus Christ the Lord. Glory to God, whose power and working in us can be infinitely more than we can ask for him. Glory to God from generation to generation, and the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.